everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, today I'm going to talk about using categorical grammars to automatically generate music. And um, just to give you a preview, categorical grammars are not category theory. I've already been asked that today. They're a formalism from linguistics that I think we're going to find proves pretty helpful for also talking about music. So what am I going to talk about? First, I'm going to go a little bit broad, if you'll forgive me, and introduce sort of the tension between music, viewing music as mathematical, formal, computational, or linguistic, expressive, meaningful. Um, then I'm going to focus specifically on sort of the mathematical representation of music, in particular what I call musical objects. Then I'll go back, discuss the linguistics, the categorical grammars, which are linguistic application, and their use in describing music. So we'll get the sense of how uh, music and math kind of come together. And finally, perhaps the most fun part, we'll actually get to hear some music. I'll use these categorical grammars to generate music. So, okay, first big picture. So in 500 BC, Pythagoras heard some hammersmith blowing, um, striking these irons, which were certain proportions between each other in length. And he noticed that the proportions they were in size was related to the intervals that he heard. And this just astonished him, because it meant that math was, music was sounding number, it was math itself. And this idea that music is intimately and fundamentally a math, or a natural harmonic science, persisted through the Middle Ages. At the same time, um, at, in the Renaissance, in Western culture, and much earlier in other cultures, such as Indian culture, um, people started thinking of music in terms of musica poetica. This idea that music is heightened rhetoric, it's meaningful even when it doesn't have a text, it's um, something expressive. And since that time, people have sort of come down on one side or the other, either formal or the expressive, um, when describing music. Different theorists, composers, philosophers have come up with sort of different ideas of, well, what really is music? But as I hope to show, there's actually no problem with viewing music as something mathematical and something linguistic. So first, there is no denying that, ma that music is mathematical in some way. Now, why did I say that? The simplest answer comes from looking at representations of music. Now, there's a lot of ways of representing music. There's uh, MIDI, which if I simplify a bit, involves just lists of tuples, so a tuple that has a pitch, which is an integer, how high or low the note is, a duration, which is a float, how long the note is, uh, an offset, which is a float, um, or a decimal, um, where the note is, and an instrument, which is some sort of mean of, is it a piano or a violin or a viola or whatever. There's also raw audio, which is a representation of the wavelength itself of the music, or how the music is perceived. But the simplest representation of music is very simple. If you see at the, um, up here, I talk about, uh, I present a list of numbers. It might look incomprehensible, but that's actually the simplest possible representation of Mary Had a Little Lamb, which at least in America is a really well-known nursery song. Um, and each, the first number in each tuple is the pitch, 64 is middle E, the second number is the length, 1.0 is a quarter of. And there's an immediate relationship between the numbers and how we perceive them. Now this is not true in everything. There is not an immediate representation, um, in, in, an immediate difference between how we perceive a word in terms of all of its structure and meaning and the binary representation of the word. But here, the fact that the two notes are 64 versus 62 means that they're two half steps apart. The fact that they both have a duration of 1.0 means we perceive them as the same length. So music is very, very much a numbers game. And I'm sorry if this is obvious to you, but it's not. it was not obvious to me before I started studying music, so I think it's something interesting to talk about. So at the same time, yes, music is, um, music rock is a string of two folds of pitch and duration, but it also, it is a mathematical object, but it's a very complex one, much more complex than that surface would seem to indicate. So this is just an arbitrarily chosen, the first passage of Claude Debussy's Girl with the Flaxen Hair. And I could represent this just as I represented Mary Had a Little Lamb as a string of uh, 
examples of pitch and duration. But that's not really all that's happening. Um, there's so much that's going on that, compose, that theorists would talk about that are sort of real in some sense. So this passage heavily draws on the pentatonic scale. What that means is that the notes chosen, their pitch classes, sort of the note mod 12, is all um, done based on, uh, is, is all chosen from the pentatonic scale, from a five note collection. There's an emphasis on pitch class D. Emphases are developed in different ways, whether through metric placement or through dynamics. Here it's that the note, the Ds are longer and occur at the beginning and the end. There's a certain repetitive rhythmic figure that you hear again and again. Um, there's um, <coughs> some more interesting operations going on. You can describe music in terms of an operation or a function of inversion, turning the notes upside down and transposition, moving them up and down. Um, and that, that is something that occurs in the music, and something similar, repetition, also occurs in the music. So all of these things are just as real as the representation in terms of a string of tuples, um, as things that occur in the music. Um, so how do we talk about those things? Well, I'm going to go into that in more detail, but I'm going to start with the assumption that we're all okay with this fact. We can have a string of numbers that are generated by a very complex process. And that's essentially what, um, and there's no tension between that, between seeing it as a flat, seeing a flat list of numbers and knowing that a very complex process generated them. And that's true in music, too. I mean, you can have a very complex process that's generating a, something that we just see as a string of notes. And these processes um, involve sort of musical objects or the sorts of things that music theorists talk about, like scales, like inversion. Um, that are just as real as the melody or the list of notes, but aren't as, uh, don't tend to be, tend to be more implicit. <coughs> so what are these musical objects? So they're the things we were used to from our little musical representation or MIDI and stuff. There's the duration, there's um, the pitch, so how long a note is, how high it is. There's the melody, which is the grand total, the list of all of these notes with duration and pitch. But there's also some things that are less immediately obvious. So there's, a, um, when you're talking about music and what generates it, you almost certainly, if it's tonal music, will talk about a scale, which is sort of the pitch classes that are used to, gener to generate it. Now these can be sort of probabilistically extracted, and sometimes it's immediately obvious, from the piece of music, even though they don't tend to be represented in MIDI or WAV files or any of these other representations of music. There's also functions that play real roles, and you can tell when there's a retrograde or playing something backwards in music, even though it's not actually represented by the, um, by the melody. But it's just as sort of a real and an object as, um, the, uh, as the melody itself. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking specifically with a linguistic formalism on how to describe the relationship between these musical objects and the melody. So now to categorical grammars, which I promise will be useful. So categorical grammars are really interesting. They were developed in 1970 by Richard Montague, around the time when people were starting to realize, a little bit later than this, but around the time when people were starting to realize hey, language itself is pretty mathematical. And this formalism is one that all of you functional programmers are going to like because it's based largely on type theory and lambda calculus. The main premise is you have words which have different types. The sort of thing that the word, that the word all, all which the quantifier does, is not the same as what the word dog, which is a constant, does. And all of these words can be described in terms of different types of a lambda calculus. But together, when they're composed together, like you compose lambda functions, they always form a predicate calculus statement. So the sum of a sentence is always predicate calculus, but it's derived in interesting ways from the words in the statement. So here's just a simple example. Um, Kim walked and fed the dog. So as you can see, each of these words has sort of a different representation. Um, Kim is a constant, walk is a predicate, and is a little interesting. It's a, it takes two predicates and a constant and returns a predicate calculus representation. But when you kind of fit them all together and compose them in a way that makes sense, 
um, what you get in the result is a um, predicate calculus statement, walk, can, and fed, can, and dog. So the idea is that um, all of these words combine together to produce something that's, it, the words are always going to combine together to produce a predicate logic statement, even though every word has sort of a different role. So why am I bringing this up? Well, first of all, before I describe specifically how music uses categorical grammars, I'll decide why I thought that, that could even remotely be useful, which is because music does have very have linguistic aspects. Now, I'm not going to get into how music conveys emotion, what, what music means from a narrative perspective, but music has semantics, it has content, it has syntax, it has structure. So I'll talk more about what I mean by semantics when I talk about music, but basically it's very natural to think about it in terms of um, in terms of language. So how am I going to use categorical grammars? Basically I'm going to relate categorical grammars um, very expressively between linguistic objects and music, uh, between linguistics and music. So in linguistics, words have different types in the type lambda calculus. Um, and the other, on the other hand, musical objects, such as scales, such as rhythms, such as inversions, um, also have different types. The thing that an inversion does is not the same thing that a note does. But just like you know you always get a predicate calculus statement out of a sentence, you know you always get a melody out of the music. That's sort of the end game, is you get a melody. All of these objects have to combine to produce a melody. Um, and just like words combine in sort of an interesting way, musical objects can also combine in an interesting way to produce that melody. So here's an example. We have um, some objects. We have a uh, a rhythm, which is a half, eighth note, eighth note, quarter note, a starting pitch, which is 60, a contour, contour is described from the relative height, so 1, 3, 2 means the first note is the smallest, the third note is the largest, the second note is the largest, and the third note is in the middle. Now we have a function which combines <coughs> the function, takes a rhythm, a pitch, and a contour, and returns a melody. And we can describe this as a sort of, uh, as a lambda expression, which uses, uh, which takes uh, into account all of these things and returns some sort of melody. Or, in this case, a set of melodies. Because this lambda expression happens to not um, completely, uh, this lambda expression happens to not completely um, specify which melody it is. If any, if this uh, lambda expression describes any melody with a starting pitch of 60, mil C, a um, rhythm of 8 note, 8 note, quarter note, and a contour of 1, 3, 2. Um, so it's a set of melodies that are specified by this lambda expression. Now you can say, so let's go back to that, you can say, well, there's no real lambda calculus going on in there. Um, it's just, you're just throwing in some lambdas and uh, lambda xyz and then doing combine xyz, and it's not very exciting. And you're probably right, um, but there's a couple of reasons why I think that's a useful way to think about things, and not just because I'm comparing it to language. Um, first is that combine is a function that, um, that takes certain, um, so combine is a function that uh, takes these three values, the rhythm, the start pitch, and the contour, and returns something. And it's got a specific algorithm that could be described in terms of lambda calculus, just like any, so here's a Pythonic description of it. But it could be described in lambda calculus. So briefly, how combine works, you start with the start pitch, find all pitches that are um, other pitches, and come up with a list that's the same length as the rhythm. Um, filter out ones that don't have the desired contour, and match the pitches with the rhythm. Um, so even though I didn't get to any fancy lambda calculus, because this is too, a little bit too complicated to describe the lambda calculus, there really are interesting operations going on. 
And the combined function I'm going to claim is just as much a real um, musical object as the rhythm and the pitch themselves, and that it could be used to generate a melody. Now, most people are probably not generating melodies by taking all, uh, taking a rhythm and finding every melody with the start pitch and the contour of um, uh, that go with it, but it is one valid way of producing music. So this combined function is a valid useful object. Also, things get more interesting when you add some other functions and add some um, and add some hierarchical nesting. So musical music is very hierarchical. There tends to be a lot of sort of nesting going on. And um, so two functions that I'm going to introduce are to augment, which um, in this case I augmented by two. I'm um, increasing the uh, length of each note and transpose, where you um, move the height of each note. And here's a lambda expression that represents um, a certain hierarchically nested expression, where I start with the same one <coughs> iteration of that same set that I was looking at before, um, with a rhythm of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 1.0, a start pitch in middle C, and a contour of 1, 3, 2, and I try first transposing it by taking both the set and the transposition of the set. And then I take that and take that and the augmentation of that. And what I get is a sort of interesting melody, which has sort of nested um, properties to it. Um, so we get this melody, which um, can um, it involves sort of nested expressions. And here the lambda calculus proves very useful. So briefly, musical semantics. Um, in terms of these categorical grammars, because I sort of promised I'd talk about that a bit. So, um, basically, I don't have a great answer for what sort of the semantics of music is, but I'm going to try my best. So, in, um, in linguistics, we talk about the semantics of words being sort of what they, mappings from uh, platonic time worlds to values, um, to truth values. And here, I think we can describe the semantics of individual expressions in terms of sort of the objects in the platonic musical universe that they represent. So I'm not going to talk about sort of narratives or emotions. I'm going to say you can describe the semantics in terms of sort of uh, this has the semantics of a pentatonic scale with an inversion. Then the semantics of a melody, which is more interesting, is sort of recursively defined by the semantics of all the categorical analyses that can be used to generate it. So basically, what I'm trying to get at is that music is describable in terms of the uh, in terms of the things that are used to analyze it. So part of the semantics of the um, girl with the flaxen hair, the piece by Claude, Claude Debussy that I showed you, was the existence of the inversion because an inversion could be used to generate it. Um, so that's just my short little take on musical semantics. Okay, so now I get to the fun part, automatically generating musical lambda expressions. So how am I going to do this? First, I'm going to describe a sort of graph which describes the relationship between the various types in terms of the functions that can be used to combine them. Then I'm going to try to create a new graph which uses a subset of those, fun of those functions or those types um, to generate some new music. So here is a very um, one, uh, one possible tree in this case that could be used to generate um, to generate some music. So we've got a scale type and a key, scale type being maybe diatonic or whole tone, basically what kind of collection of notes you're using, and the key, what note you're starting on, to produce a scale. A scale with a scale degree, what note of the scale you're starting on, and a sign, is it going to be flat or uh, sharp, produces a chord. Uh, some operation that transforms one chord into many chords produces a list of chords, which can be described as a list of pitch classes. Then a rhythm can be described using, well, it has n notes, and it's got a length of x, and you can choose the starting octave. You put all these things together, and you choose a melody. 
So this is what I mean by the relationship between types, is there are combined functions, like the combined function I showed you before, which takes these different things and produces the sort of higher <coughs> objects. But it turns out there's a lot of useful objects, and um, they can be sort of described in many ways. There's a lot of ways of combining uh, pitch classes, contours, interval vectors um, to produce new and exciting useful objects. So what am I going to do with this? Basically, I want to generate a path from some useful object to, um, from some uh, basic object which has a certain basic uh, value, like say pitch class only has one of 12 values. So I want to get from a given pitch class to a melody. And I'm going to do that sort of recursively, where I'm going to see what steps do I have to take, what functions do I have to use to get from a pitch class to a melody. Now on the way, I might need a rhythm. So then I'll need to generate a rhythm. What steps do I need to get to generate a rhythm? Um, and I'm going to do this recursively until I've constructed a graph which tells me sort of everything that I need to generate this melody. All the functions that I need and all the values that I need. And um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to also, um, sorry, um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this graph and then I'm going to translate it into a actual code. I'm going to translate it back into sort of a lambda expression. And along the way, I'm going to use other functions like augment, like invert, like functions that do fancy things on lists. Uh, because I might have a list of chords or a single chord and I have to figure out how to get between them. Um, I'm going to do this, use hierarchically nested expressions. And I'm going to do all these fancy things to come up with sort of a interesting hierarchical representation of, um, the, uh, of the music uh, using these basic types of the functions that combine them. So the result. This is a very simple result. Um, basically, uh, the code's a little ugly, but um, the, the combined 10, combined uh, 11, combined 15 are just different functions that are used that take in different objects and return other objects. Um, and other things like odd, dim, repeat, melody, add a pudge, or melody are um, functions that map from melody to melody. Um, they're functions that map from chord to chord. Um, and all of these things are um, used to generate a very simple melody. So I specifically chose this example because it's very simple and because it uses the same tree that I described here. So basically this function is described is defined by taking a scale type in P and a degree in sign or a couple different scale types in P, degree in sign, um, doing some functions on them, deriving chords, um, just doing some functions on them, driving rhythm, doing some functions on them, driving melody, doing some functions on them. And this is what it sounds like. doing this very hierarchical formulation is that you tend to get a lot of repetition. Um, but it also has um, some interesting properties in terms of the sort of harmony of what's going on in there. And I have more interesting examples. This was sort of specifically chosen to be simple. I have some more specific examples and more interesting examples that I can show you if, um, if you're interested after the talk. All right, so that's it.
any of time for questions. Uh, yeah. um, well, it's kind of a diagram of people. You are you're given a sentence, yeah. and you try to find some evidence to reconstruct the meaning behind that sentence. Mm -hmm. So have you looked into taking a, a piece of music and trying to reconstruct the operations that the composer applied in their head to compose that piece of music, so that you go from the actual written down piece of sheet music to a bunch of these lambda operations which generate it? Yeah, so I haven't done a lot of work um, with uh, actually um, generating the new the category of expression from uh, existing music, because it tends to be a little bit more complicated, but there certainly are examples where you can do some of that. I've tried coming up with sort of programmatic um, lambda expression. It's for um, for some WC music. And um, I, I don't think it's in my paper, but um, it certainly is possible to um, to describe music that already exists in terms of these. I think what's interesting about um, analyzing music as opposed to analyzing sentences is with sentences, there are Basically, you're looking for the right way of analyzing something. Um, there's, you know, for any given piece of music or any sentence, there's basically one correct uh, categorical grammar. Uh, you might disagree with that, but um, my 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 understanding is there's sort of one categorical grammar that really works for describing a sentence. All men talk is sort of, you know, a very standard. You got a quantifier. You got men. You got a predicate talk. Um, but uh, with music, what's interesting is that there's more than one, people can say a lot about one piece of music, and in terms of generative sort of models of analysis, what that means is there's more than one way to generate a good piece of music. And I'd say that when I said that the semantics of a piece of music is sort of a sum of all categorical analyses or categorical generations of it, um, what I, that means is that you know there's one way of talking about this music in terms of you know, um, symmetries and chord spaces, and you can just define sort of types of chords and symmetries, and you can use that to generate it, and that means that that's sort of part of what the music is, and there's another way to talk about it in terms of, um, in terms of sort of set theoretic transformations, and that's also sort of a valid, that can be used in a categorical grammar to analyze something, so there's more than one analysis possible. So, I feel like so far all the computational music research I've seen all target at uh, uh, C music score. So they're at most as expressive of tra traditional C music. So do you see opportunity of some uh, some sort of computational music that's more expressive than the traditional way of encoding? So if you're talking about things like timbre and like things that you really can't describe using music because they deal with sort of the sound synthesis itself. I believe someone today is going to be talking about super collider, which is a language for describing um, for describing sound synthesis. So I won't get into that. But it, I think it would be very cool to have a um, to have some to create some sort of environment for composing that actually knew something about the theory that could tell you. Hey, um, there's a you ended this with a tonic chord. Here's what it could sound like if it ended with a dominant chord. So in that sense, it would be really cool to see um, some music software that knows more theory and can apply it to a piece of music. Yes. Um, so I, I, I don't know much this category category of grammar. What I understand is that lambda expressions are actually in relation. Uh, between arguments and possible values that would. Mm -hmm. uh, so your your example of contour was clear, and now generating you, so generating music, I guess you are you are looking for instance of uh, for possible instance of this relation, and then generating music. Uh, often it is a good idea that something repeats so that you can remember it. So what what does repeat exactly in your? In your example, can you say that I want to generate first a melody and then I want to take that generated melody to make some derivative derivation of it? Is it yeah. possible with your approach? Yeah, so I mean, I'm sure you've heard the problem with the music act extension is it is a little too repetitive. But um, basically, repetition I define as sort of, you know, you can either, it, it's, you can either do lambda x dot, you know, I use uh, square brackets for xx, meaning 
x occurring temporally followed by another x. So basically, basically what I just what I describe is um, I use brackets to describe things that are occurring sort of sequentially, and um, it's possible to describe something occurring sequentially once after the other, either um, exactly the same or augmented or transposed or retrograded or something like that. So yeah, it's definitely possible to talk about sort of repetitions, and they are very important. Uh, just coming back a bit to the first question, um, you can use grammars to generate uh, terms in a language, which is, is what you're using them for, but one, one also uses them to analyze existing terms in a language, which I think what was when he was asking. And uh, existing language is, is usually much richer and often deliberately uh, playing with the boundaries of, uh, of, of grammatical classes. So cryptic crossword clues, for example, uh, will have a surface parse, which is deliberately designed to lead you astray from what they're, what they're actually saying. And there's another way of parsing the same the same sequence of words that leads to the solution of the question. <coughs> and music does the same. And there's, a, uh, there's a very interesting book, recent book by Alan Rosbridger, uh, an amateur pianist learning to play a, a very difficult Chopin piece. And uh, he does lots of interviews with real musicians who, who explain some of the structure. But um, there, there are arguments going on between professional musicians about whether a certain part of this piece um, should be thought of as being uh, in A major or E major. You know, the details are beyond me. But if you try to analyze that using some uh, some grammatical rules, um, they will presumably fail or uh, point out the ambiguity or be inadequate. And Chopin presumably was deliberately playing with where the boundaries between the, the modulations were. Um, so so uh, using grammars for analysis is much harder than using them for generation, I think. Yeah, agreed. Um, so, um, first of all, a book that I think you'd really like are a series of lectures by Leonard Bernstein, six talks at Harvard for anyone. Is um, It was basically the first book that sort of spurred the... So, um, De Fred Lertle and Ray Jackendoff were the first people he sort of systematically used grammars to describe music, but they were sort of inspired by Leonard Bernstein, who talked about sort of ambiguities in music and their similarity to ambiguities in language. Um, um, within a broader description of the relationship between music and language. Um, and he specifically tried to describe Chopin. So, um, well, the good thing that I think is makes it easier as a musician than as a uh, linguist is that when we're describe, this, dealing with language, we really want to figure out the be only of it. So there's all these descriptions of things like all men like some women. Do they all like the same woman? Do they all like different women? And when we're talking about language, the goal is to describe, to map from time worlds to truth values, to describe, well, in this world, is this true or not? So we really need to know what it means. But I don't think there's any problem with saying, well, we can generate this piece of music under the assumption that it's in A major, so just analyzing it in terms of A major is useful, and we can generate it in terms of uh, using E minor, so E minor is useful. Um, and so I don't... I think as musicians we have it a little bit easier because we're fine with ambiguity in a way that linguists really aren't. I actually want to strongly disagree with your remark that analysis, that a generation is somehow easier than analysis in this domain. Uh, and I want to point out that it's extremely easy in this domain to come up with essentially a garbage grammar that will successfully analyze whatever you want. Well, that's true. We want to distinguish between. And the difficulty in having something that successfully analyzes and generates right. successfully. I agree. So in natural language semantics, um, categorical grammars and control effects like shift and reset have been used to model certain uh, certain features of natural language like focus, so where I place emphasis on a word. Do you know if um, there is an, some interpretation of control effects in music? Um, no, I don't. I'm sorry, I don't know much about focus, so. If, if there's time for one more question, okay. uh, uh, I'd like to ask about your use of contour. Um, uh, yeah, so contour happens to be, it's not very, so it's not from a total context, so a lot of people um, don't use it, but um, within, so basically there's been different movements of music that have been 
introduce different types of objects. So um, the scale or a collect or or the scale type like diatonic or whole tone or octave <coughs> is something that's very specific to 19th or early 20th century music. Before the scale type was diatonic, it was assumed afterwards there were no scales. Um, the idea of the contour comes up in some uh, set theoretic music where they're like, you need an organizing principle other than the scale, why don't we use the relative size height of the pitches? So it's just a construct which people use that, um, in set theoretic music. It's so just a musical object that wasn't invented until pretty recently. When you say, uh, specifically though, when you say something like 132, what is that referring to? Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I should have described that more. Are the scale of the C? It's the basically, it means that it, it's talking about the relative height of pitches, such as the first one, the first pitch is the lowest, the second pitch is the highest, and the third pitch is the lowest. Oh, so, okay. uh, the, okay. a pit, uh, the note uh, with a contour value of A is the end highest. Okay. In one scale, or in some option? So this was actually invented in uh, when people were trying to move away from scales. So this was there's music that doesn't have scales at all, and this was one way of so people needed organizing principles for describing music without scales. Yeah, I heard that too, but it's also described. All right, thank you very much.